Today is December 12th in the Idaho murder case, and Kaylee's father, Steve, has spoken with Fox News exclusively, and I'm going to tell you some new information, but please brace yourself. These details are graphic. Please note the following information that I'm about to share with you can be found on Fox News' website in this publication. You've shared that their family is currently raising funds and hope to have the public step forward with information. Um, they say that they would like to offer a reward for information and possibly hire a private investigator at this time. Steve shared how he paid $10 to get a copy of his daughter Kaylee's death certificate. And on that death certificate, it did have um, more details into how she died. Steve shares that the victims had big open gouges that were clearly the work of a sadistic male and called police cowards for not sharing this information with the public. Steve shared with Fox News how he asked the coroner, Kathy, how many times were each of the victims stabbed? In Kathy's disturbing response, she says, Sir, I don't think stabs is the right word. It was like tears, like this was a strong weapon, not a stab. She continued in saying that the wounds were big open gouges. These weren't something where you were going to be able to call 911. Steve shares, the knife slashed open Kaylee's liver and lungs. The coroner also told him that the perpetrator had to have been a strong individual, but the police have yet to identify the suspect's gender. And lastly, the coroner Kathy had shared that the toxicology reports have not come in at this time. The murder of Kaylee Gonzalez was quick, meaning that she didn't slowly bleed to death after being stabbed multiple times. And this is new information that we are learning from her dad, Steve Gonzalez. Kaylee's father has been releasing more and more information about these brutal Idaho college murders. You'll remember that he was the one who actually alerted the public to the fact that Kaylee's wounds were significantly more brutal than the other three victims in the house. Police have been very careful about what details they are giving the public, and they're not even telling the families of the victims many of the details about the crime scene. However, the information about Kaylee's specific body and her injuries have been given to Steve, he says, from the coroner. So what we're learning now is more about the extent of Kaylee's brutal stab wounds. And Steve says that he was told by the coroner that Kaylee's lungs and liver were both punctured in the stabbing. He added that the coroner described these injuries as less like a stab and more like a tear, calling them big open gouges, which indicated to the medical examiner that Kaylee bled out very quickly. Steve says it was the coroner who also alerted him to the fact that Kaylee's wounds were significantly more severe than her best friend Maddie, who died in the bed right next to her. The state of the victim's bodies can tell investigators a lot of different things. In this case, in Kaylee's instance, the severity of her wounds could indicate to investigators that she was perhaps the intended target and or she was the first person murdered. often bag the hands of a murder victim and for good reason because when people fight for their life they will scratch and they will claw at their killer like their life depends on it and it is honestly the very last thing that a victim can do to help the police catch the person that ultimately kills them because in that scratching frenzy the killer's skin cells become embedded under the victim's nails and if that victim happens to claw at the killer's clothing, fibers might also get lodged under those victim's fingernails. And so bagging the hands of a victim preserves that magical, precious evidence as those bodies head off to the office of the medical examiner for autopsy. And today, a report that that is exactly what happened to these four kids and their bodies. And there was something else that was revealed today, a report that Steve Gonsalves had been informed by the medical examiner that his daughter, Kaylee, that her injuries were more ferocious than her friends. Specifically, the report said that the stab wounds were less like stab wounds and more like tears. But we talked to the coroner today, asking if she would describe Kaylee's injuries that way as tears, and she said no. Clearly, exclamation point, in fact. And it honestly seems exactly that that's what she has said from the get-go, because here she is on November 17th, just days after the killings. She was actually speaking with me live on this program about the nature of the kids' injuries. Have a listen. 
And I only ask this because it sometimes determines what kind of a, a crime this was, a crime of passion, a, a random crime, a, a fight, a struggle. Was there, uh, were any of them uh, slashed? Were, were any of their necks cut? Um, or were these all puncture wounds? Well, it was a pretty large knife, so it's really hard to call them puncture wounds. And they were definitely stabbings. And um, I mean, it has to be somebody that's pretty angry in order to stab four people to death. Also in question today, a report that says Kaylee's lungs and liver were slashed. Maybe not, according to what the coroner told us a month ago. Have a listen. There were multiple stab wounds, um, yes, on, on them. So, and were there, go ahead. And most of them had just like one that was the lethal uh, stab wound, yes. Can you describe what that one might have been? Um, but they were to um, the Fatal ones were to the chest area or the upper body area. You know, it's hard to separate fact from fiction, especially with so little clarity from law enforcement. The Moscow police told me today, in that exclusive interview that you were watching, that silence is strategic, you know, to preserve the case for a trial down the road. I get that. So to help us make sense of it all, I'm joined now by Joseph Scott Morgan. He's a forensic analyst and a certified death investigator. He's also the host of the podcast Body Bags with Joseph Scott Morgan. He's a professor, and he's done more of these cases than any of us combined. So, okay, Joe, um, hands being yes. bagged, that's par for the course. It is critical, critical, critical. What if there's nothing under those fingernails? Is that ever the case that there's nothing under four yeah. victims' fingernails? Yeah, it is. Uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, one of the one of the things we find with bodies many times that's caught in the hands, and it's not necessarily under the fingernails, Ash, is uh, is hair, hair from the mm. perpetrator. And many times that contacts onto the surface of the hands because the hands are spattered in blood. If you think how sticky blood is, and the perpetrator is not even aware that they've left their hair behind. That happens many times. So what about if the, if the perpetrator is wearing... Um you know, a full ski mask, right? So if you're clawing at, at the perpetrator, you're hitting the ski mask, you're not hitting his, his or her skin. Um, and gloves and a thick coat that mm -hmm. ultimately they throw out or burn. Is there anything valuable to what might be under the fingernails if in fact it's hard to get the skin? Sure, sure. You've got all of the either natural or synthetic fibers that arise from any garment that the individual is wearing, including a, a ski mask, for instance, that might be made of some kind of acrylic or some kind of blend uh, that you see with these things many times. And so you can you can get evidence from there as well. It's quite fascinating things that can be collected from hands. And you have to keep in mind, you heard of us doing nail scrapings. We do that after the bags are removed. And we also do nail trimmings, but the bags are set aside and kept separately. And then all of the items that are contained in there that fall off in transport are preserved. And that's very important. I've worked on cases where the killers got rid of the clothes, but they're on record as having bought them. And they're on camera yeah. at the Walmart in the checkout. And sometimes yep. there's just that fiber that's so unique, they can yes. actually trace it. So there are ways, and I want to feel optimistic about it. Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. At least that's what a lot of people think. And here's some of the evidence that they cite when they talk about this case. So after his initial arrest, Jeffrey Epstein was placed on suicide watch for a number of reasons, even though he was continuously telling prison psychologists, friends, attorneys that he wouldn't do that and he's never considered it. So first of all, let's take a look at this sign. This is a sign that was hanging on or around Jeffrey Epstein's jail cell. No one knows why this question mark is around the mandatory. A newspaper even reached out to the Bureau of Prisons to ask about why there was an underlying question mark here, but they refused to comment. 7.49 on the night before they found Epstein dead in his cell. He's led to his cell and he's placed there. So Epstein had been on suicide watch for weeks at this point, but he had just been taken off suicide watch the day before. The people running the prison, the Bureau of Prison System, they recommended that Jeffrey Epstein needed to have a roommate at all times. Even if he had been taken off of the list, he was still on the list, if you know what I mean. 
Well, for some reason, that night his roommate was not assigned to him, they were removed from the cell, and that left Jeffrey Epstein completely alone in his jail cell. Now, remember this sign that said that they have to search his cell and look at Jeffrey Epstein every 30 minutes? Well, that did not happen. Well, it turns out that the two security guards that were supposed to check on him every 30 minutes, Michael Thomas and Tova Noel, did not check on him for over eight hours. Video surveillance footage literally shows them playing with their phones and sleeping on the job. And keep in mind that Epstein at this point was America's most high profile criminal. This dude was all over the news. And after all this, these two were charged with falsifying documents and attempting to defraud the federal government. So something that's always kind of rubbed me the wrong way about all this is the security camera footage itself. Now, this is a prison. Every angle should have been being captured at every single moment. You know, anything can happen in prison. And video footage of the security guards exists from that night, but there is no video footage of Epstein's cell block area or his cell door. It's actually been reported that the camera that was shooting the angle down Jeffrey Epstein's cell block area corrupted the night that he took his own life. Of all times for this one specific camera to corrupt and the footage to be lost, it was that night when it happened. And there's a lot more that we're going to get into, but like I said, there's just a lot here that we're going to cover, but this quote really says a lot about what I just told you. So Epstein's taken off suicide watch the day before he kills himself. His roommate is removed from the cell. The cameras on his tier are not working. The guards fell asleep. It seems almost impossible to think all those things could happen in that way. And this is Epstein we're talking about, America's most high profile prisoner. In fact, the suicide watch observation log, this is the actual document, shows that Epstein was acting pretty normally that day. Which isn't to say that he wasn't deceiving people by saying he didn't want to take his own life when he was secretly trying to get alone time where he could do it, but, but it's still an interesting side note. In the next TikTok, we're going to get into the really crazy stuff. Just give me it, please. It started with a kiss. I'll take a be more than this. You're all that I need. Just give it to me. Love is not the thing that you asked for. I know you have these. I wanted to kill my mother since I was eight years old, and I'm not proud of that. A month later, I'm up living with my grandparents in the mountains, and 10 months later, I murdered them. It made it worse to be on top of a mountain. I was literally on top of a mountain when it happened. And I could sense, I sensed everybody in the world just stopping what they were doing, turning around, saw what I did, and are coming to get me. And I knew I was paranoid at that moment. I knew anybody that came up there and gave me a funny look or a fishy eye or quizzical look, I'd have blown their brains out thinking they were coming to get me. And if it had been in a city, I would have been a mass murderer at age 15. I would have killed until they gunned me down. I wouldn't have been able to reason my way out of it. I was scared to death and I was violent. I felt my back hit that wall. I was the rabbit that always ran, that always backed away, always burned his bridges. And suddenly there weren't any more. And I, my back hit that wall and I came out screaming and kicking and shooting. 